So I just wanted to give a few a few minutes to the background of uh, how I was introduced to Joan Moyer. Joan Moyer is the daughter of Mo Howard, and she's uh, also the wife of a man by the name of Norman Moyer. And Norman Moyer worked in comic books. Um, in the 1950s, he and Joe Kubert uh, invented the 3D process for magazines and comic books. So they was, um, Norman was over in uh, Germany um, before the Korean War and saw the process over there, so he took it over here and tried to uh, uh, publicize the 3D process here, which he was successful on, but it was a fad. It didn't last more than a year. And the comic book company he worked for went bankrupt because of it. <laughs> but he did stay in comics for quite a while, <clears throat> met Joan. Uh, he was already married to Joan at that time. Uh, and uh, Mo Howard liked creativity. So he asked Norman to become his um, uh, agent, producer, and director. And so Norman was the sto he did storyboards for skits. Uh, he would help write skits. Uh, he definitely directed and produced uh, in the 60s all the shorts that you saw with uh, uh, the last Curly, um, the, the ones where they actually owned the properties they were doing. Uh, Mo Howard passed away, I believe, 72. But Joan will correct me on some of these dates, but uh, 72. And uh, Norman passed away uh, 1980. Um, right now, Joan is uh, doing little interviews with uh, certain stations because there is a 3D movie coming, or a Three Stooges movie coming out in April. Uh, the re Warner Brothers has uh, redone the Three Stooges um, series uh, with new actors, obviously, and in April it'll be coming out. And right now, actually, there's a uh, there's an advertisement for it already. If if you haven't seen it already. <clears throat> For me, Three Stooges was something I grew up on. Uh, there was magic there uh, as a child watching reruns on TV. And so learning more and more about the Three Stooges started to bring down the curtain for me. <laughs> and that's the danger of interviewing too many people. Um, you'll find uh, very informative stuff here from her. So her memory is just as sharp as her dad's. I had heard interviews of Mo Howard in the past, and uh, up until the end, his uh, he could recite lunches he was serving to silent movie actors. He was very, very uh, with it, and so is Joan. Um, Joan is not in charge. Of, uh, there's one thing, and I'm bringing this up before I call her. There's one thing I can't talk about with uh, about the Three Stooges, and that's who is in charge of the Three Stooges licensing and um, and and the property and intellectual property. And there was a lawsuit in the '90s, and in the '90s, the last surviving uh, Stooge was um, Curly Joe. I believe he was a Canadian. Um, I, I can't remember his exact name. Joe Dorita. Joe Dorita. Thank you. Curly Joe Dorita. So when it went to um, court, a live stooge had more sway over three dead stooges. So Curly Joe Dorita uh, managed and took control of three stooges' property. And this is all on uh, Wikipedia, so I, I don't have a problem telling you this, but she can't talk about it because uh, in her agreement, that was one of the things she had to sign was a a, um, a gag order. So Joe Dorita's uh, Joe Dorita's sons, who are both lawyers, uh, run the Three Stooges uh, property right now. So, but she still has a stake in it. She's just a silent stake, so she can't really do anything about that. So no questions about that, please. If you have one, you can ask me now. Uh, but I don't want to ask her. Okay. Yes, Tom. Residuals? Yes, she does. In fact, uh, the last residual she got was a couple of months ago for seven cents. <laughs> she says uh, it's worth more non-cashed <laughs> as memorabilia than it is cashed. So uh, she'll probably bring that up. Um, as things re-air and re-air and re-air, uh, you get less and less and less. Uh, but all the stuff that we're, we've all seen in the 40s, uh, they don't own that. Um, Harry Cohen, uh, they were on salary. They were just salary with no stake in the property at all. So they don't own anything until uh, they own some of the merchandising, but they don't own any of the shorts. Yes. Did they buy out uh, their interest from Ted Healy? No. Ted, Ted didn't. Um, 
Oh, well, she'll explain it. Actually, we can talk about that. <laughs> Ted and Mo Howard uh, go back from, they were childhood friends, and they started in vaudeville together, and that's how the Three Stooges were formed, and she'll go through that. Ted Healy was a drunk. Uh, they had a long feud for quite a many years, but he didn't make it past his 40th birthday, so they didn't have a chance to really um, make amends. So, But she, she can talk about that type of stuff. Um, are we all set? Any other questions before I get on? Ooh. Okay. <clears throat> I am now. <laughs> Hello. Joan, this is Sean. Oh, hi. Hi, can you hear me good? Yeah, I think so. Okay. You're live right now in front of our, our reps club um, so they can hear you. So um, uh, I, I'd like to thank you for taking the call and uh, letting us talk to you today. Oh, that's fine. As I introduced the audience to who you were and what your relationship is to the Three Stooges and who your husband was. So um, I, we can get right into the good, the good stuff. If you can, I didn't tell them how the Three Stooges were uh, formed. Can you go into something like that for us? Well, I'm not too good at it, like my dad was, but uh, <laughs> I think to a degree I could. And the other thing I don't want to mention, I was just thinking, was uh, Paul's documentary. I don't know how he feels about that. Okay, uh, you, you know the audience heard you say that, right? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so how did, um, uh, how did Mo, the, 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 everybody recognizes Mo, Larry, and Curly as the, uh, as the original Stooges, but that's really not the case, is it? Uh, well, Mo, Larry, and Curly. Uh, if you mean Curly Jerome, uh, the, the, the original, before Curly, was Shemp. Right. That was an older brother. Started with Mo and Vaudeville. And and how did, did he get involved in Vaudeville in the first place? How did who? How did they get in Vaudeville in the first place? Oh, my dad uh, befriended Ted Healy, who was an actor and became very successful in the early years. And my dad used to go to the beach. He was a lifeguard in the early years. And he would, uh, they'd play the ukulele and they'd sing. And one day, uh, a few years later, uh, he went into the theater one time when, she, when Ted Healy was performing. And uh, Ted asked him to come up on the stage because he was missing uh, somebody that was part of his act who was supposed to do something that this young man didn't want to do. I don't know whether he had to fall into some water or... Anyway, he refused, and my dad, uh, it was like they had to be on a trapeze, and my dad said, well, I could do that at the beach in the sand, but I don't know if I could fall onto a wood floor and not kill myself. So anyway, uh, he did uh, join with Healy, as did Shemp, uh, and that was the beginning. Do you, what year would that have been? 19... Uh, let's see. It was in the 20s. I'm trying to think of what year that could have been. I don't know, maybe 22, the early 20s. Yeah, I think you're right on 22, by the way. Um, how did Larry get involved? Well, um, the, I think uh, Healy himself felt it would be much better if they had one more person. And they went to some nightclub, I think it was called the Rainbow Gardens, and it, it, was a, it was a kind of a convoluted story, but to bring it to, to the end, uh, they were watching Larry on stage. He was playing a violin and doing a Russian dance, this Kazatsky, I think, you know, going, you kick your legs out. He looked really wild. And when they saw him, I think my dad, maybe Shep was along, and Ted Ely took one look at him. And they said, what do you think of him? Let's ask him to join the act. So that was how Larry came into the picture. And then there were so many other things. The, uh, at some point, Shemp decided to leave. He didn't, uh, Healy was a bit of an al alcoholic, and uh, he frightened Shemp. Shemp was afraid of a lot of things. 
and he was a real scaredy cat. And so he said, I'm going to leave. And also his wife was part of it. She really felt he had a lot of, of uh, oh, anyway, that he was a funny guy and he could do a job on his own. He could really be a comedian on his own. Um, so he left and then came Curly. That was my dad's kid brother. And he'd been watching them do their work through the years as a younger fellow. And he thought, the only experience he had um, meeting uh, uh, Curly was he he would go on stage by himself in um, a breakaway suit where as he would try to lead this band, the sleeve would fall off his suit. Finally, he was left in red flannel underwear. So that was Curly. And then uh, there's a lot of other little interesting details which are in some of the books. My dad's book was wonderful. Right, and I have that here. I have that so that people can see that in case. Uh, this, right. is, this, this is Moe's autobiography. The photographs are in that book. Right, correct. And was Shemp's real name Shemp? No. Uh, his mother, or the, the mother of the Stooges, uh, came over from Europe, and she couldn't speak English that well, very broken. And when she would go to call, she, his, his real name was Sam. And when she would go to call him, it came out Sams, S-A-M-S, because of her accent. And whoever was listening didn't hear the Sams. They thought it was Shemp. So that's how that name stuck. <laughs> so in case people aren't aware of this, Shemp, Curly, and Moe were brothers. Right. In addition to that, there were two older brothers. The... Right. And they were in a business that the mother liked much better. They were both metropolitan life insurance salesmen, very steady income, and uh, and she she really was afraid when she saw the Stooges the first time on screen. Uh, you know, the sound effects make it look really like they're really getting hurt. And she picked up her umbrella. She was sitting in the theater. She picked up her umbrella and she raced up the aisle to the screen and she started to hit the screen speaking in her foreign language and cursing the screen because she thought they were being manhandled. The the last name of Howard, I have here that your mother-in-law and father-in-law's real last name was Horwitz. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, how and, did, but how, my father thought on a marquee that it would, uh, Howard would work, work a lot better. And uh, we had our name, or my dad did, uh, legally changed back in the 40s. I see. Did um, were they in the show business also? Who your father? Um, the grandparents? Yeah, Jenny and Solomon. No, no, they thought that was terrible. You know, in those days, uh, she believe it or not, she could not speak English any better than uh, it was really bad, and she couldn't write in English. But she was a very successful real estate agent. Uh, I guess she worked with people that also had were immigrants. And she was able to sell property, and she did very well. The grandfather was a very religious man, and he was very adept and was not able to earn a living. My dad really respected his mother. Yeah, I, I want to correct some. I kept saying mother-in-law, father-in-law. I meant grandmother and grandfather. I'm sorry. Okay, we got it. Yeah. But anyways, um, so the uncles of Jack and Irving, w they stayed in insurance their whole lives. They never went yes. into entertainment at all. Right. They were, you know, uh, Irving, who was the oldest, died first. He died very young. It was in the days without pe penicillin, and he had a burst appendix, and he passed away uh, in his 40s. Mm, I see. I see. Um, during the Stooges with Ted Healy, why didn't Ted Healy stay with the Stooges? Well, uh, that was uh, they elected to leave him. It was a point he uh, Healy was quite successful at MGM doing dramatic and character, you know, uh, uh, supporting roles. And my dad, because of I don't know, he just really didn't treat them right either financially or the alcohol problem was getting to my dad, too. But he didn't say that to Healy. He just said, I think you're doing so great. Uh, I think we would be better off 
all of us on a row. Then Healy agreed. And so Healy stayed at MGM. He died very young. He, because of the alcohol, he got into a fight. And I think about 1936, uh, he was, uh, he died after this fight. A tussle or whatever you want to call it uh, at a restaurant in Hollywood. I see. And Mo, uh, Mo and Ted Healy never got together again? Uh, no, because of, you know, uh, his passing away. And my, it really broke my dad up because his, he had a lot of positive uh, history with uh, Ted. And that's what he liked to think about was that. And so when he lost, when Ted died, he, it really he broke. It broke him up. I see. The first short that the Stooges ever did, who was that with and what was it called? Uh, let's see if I can remember it. Uh, the second was Punch Drunks. This is the one where they really didn't, uh, um, maybe somebody out there knows before the name of it. I just slipped my mind. Is it Soup to Nuts? No. No. Okay. Uh, that was the feature over at Fox Studio. A little before that, uh, probably 1930, 31, they started at Columbia in 34, and the first one was, anyway, they weren't true stooges. In fact, Larry had a bigger role than any of them. You know, he was kind of, uh, I can probably, as we're talking, pull a book off my shelf, <laughs> and there's a filmography in the Three Stooges scrapbook, right. which I hope will help me answer your question. Okay. Okay, uh, so you can uh, I'll, go on and okay. see me other questions, and I am flipping through the book, hopefully... I'll find what I'm looking for. Well, it, maybe you can go into a little more how they went from vaudeville to shorts. How did they meet Harry Cohn? Um, well, uh, I don't know that whole story, but it, there's a story that said Larry went off in one direction to one studio, and Mo went off to another one because they wanted to make films. They, they were tired of the vaudeville world. And so... Uh, Boy, it's hard to think as I flip through pages here. <laughs> Maybe I ought to do one thing at a time. You know, when you get up into your 80s, you're lucky if you can remember anything. That's here okay. we go. Uh, oh, goodness. It's hard to... All right, wait a minute. Ely and the Stooges. Uh, uh, it's called Woman Haters. Okay. The first short that they made. And and what what studio was that with again? That was at Columbia. Columbia. And the way that started, as I was saying before, right. Larry went off to one studio and Mo went over to Columbia. Right. And they, each of them wound up signing a contract. And it was one of those things where the lawyers got into it. And the contract that my dad had uh, uh, was signed at a such and such a time. It was like hours difference. And... Columbia wound up with the Stooges. And how long were they at Columbia? I think it was in excess of 25 years. Right. They made 190 shorts. There was about 400 pieces of product. 190 shorts. They made features. They did an animated series for an independent company. And if you add them all up, it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Did they write their own gags? Well, the way that worked is the at Columbia had a writers, uh, you know, a, a, what would you call it, a whole group of writers that were under contract, and they would have writers meetings with the current writers at the studio at the time. My dad would get involved in those meetings because he really was serious about what he was doing and wanted to do a good job, and he'd come up with really clever ideas, and... Uh, Larry was more of a gag man, and uh, he would, if he was in the mood and wasn't off at the track or having fun, my dad really enjoyed working, and he would sit down with the, this group of writers, and the, the end uh, result would be a script about 35 pages long, and the, those scripts, uh, uh, you could see, I have a couple of them, and as you go through them, you could see where my dad's made little notes and crossed out certain dialogue, because he, 
it, it, you felt that it didn't sound like them. So that was all we Right. Whatever other questions you want to ask about. Sure. That. Yeah. How long did it take to film one short? Oh, my goodness. It was really ridiculous. Uh, I would say less than a week. And uh, today, you know, the average production goes off and disappears for months. <laughs> and uh, they, in the later day, days, because Columbia wanted to cut, uh, you know, what a, the, a, the cost of production, uh, they would pick up maybe a very interesting scene from an old comedy, utilize that footage, and then uh, write a story around it. And oh my gosh, in a couple of days they'd have them done. So they would use sets from other movies that were... No, no, not other shorts. They're shorts. Okay. But from uh, other films. Oh, I, like so, there, there might be a key scene with a lot of production value, right? And then they would take and wrap the storyline around that key scene, and then just add a few odds and ends to it. I see. So correct me if I'm wrong. If there was like a King Arthur set that wasn't being used for a major movie production, oh yes, they yes, would be right. told the Stooges would be uh, been told that this is available if they want it, and then write a script around it. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, I'm trying to think of a particular one. Sometimes they were historic, and they'd have a historical back background. Then they they would wear costumes that would fit that era. Right, right. I remember a haunted house scene that was probably with a dungeon and a castle, and I'm sure they didn't make the set just for the Stooges. I'm sure that was being used in oh, some no. other actions. <laughs> they shot all their shorts on a, a set called Stage Seven, and rarely even. I think once in a while they would go on location because Columbia had a ranch out in the valley. It was huge, and it would have a set that looked like a New York street and other ones that looked like a castle, not a castle, but a historical spot. Right. And how did um, Shemp get back into the Stooges? What, what happened to Curly? Well, uh, that was really sad. Uh, Curly uh, lived six lifetimes in one. He died at about 48, 46. Uh, he drank too much. He ate the wrong things. Uh, he had high blood pressure, and that just accelerated it, and he had a stroke. And at that point, uh, my dad was, like, ready to give up, but my mother was terrific. She was very encouraging. And she said, look, you're not going to be happy not doing something. My dad was one of those, like the Energizer Bunny. And uh, he would just keep going. And so my mother talked him into uh, finding another stooge. And my dad said, well, gee, Shep would be perfect. And so he came back. He uh -huh. lived till, uh, till 1955. He made quite a few shorts. Right. And then he passed away. And at that point, did they think then, of... Then they, uh, again, you know, what should he do? And uh, they, he went through that same type of... Uh, it was really sad. And uh, at that point, um, I think Columbia got involved, and uh, I can't remember the whole story about how they chose Joe Besser, but uh, he, he could have been at Columbia at the time. Well, And uh, he joined and made... I can, I'm not sure how many, 20, 30 shorts. Maybe you know that better than I do. Uh, I actually don't have that data in front of me, but I know he was there for a while. Right. Uh, how, how did he... And then uh, uh, his wife was very ill, Joe Besser's wife. And he just, when it came for a contract renewal, uh, Joe Besser decided that he was not going to continue. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think, or... Uh, I think that's almost to the end of the Columbia contract. And then after that, the Columbia contract, shoo, the contract was ended, uh, they went out and that's at that point and found Joe DeRita. I see. Was was Harry Cohn still alive during all this? As uh, part of it, I'm sure. Hmm. I don't know uh, if he was alive when uh, Mo. Uh, left Columbia, you know, when they were their contract ended. I'm not sure of that. That's right. an interesting question. I'll have to look it up. 
Yeah, I'd be curious, too, because I know he loved the Stooges. In fact, um, why don't you tell the audience how much he loved them? Uh, wasn't the um, uh, wasn't he watching these shorts before they were uh, as soon as they were done? Oh, that I, I'm not sure. Okay. But he loved them, and he loved the shorts, and he loved the money that it brought him. But he certainly didn't. Get, he certainly didn't give them a fair exchange. They never shared in any royalties on the shorts, and. Uh, uh, my dad's agent was a, a very, you know, the one that takes care of getting you the right amount of money, was a very close friend of Harry Cohn, and they play cards together. And the t between the two of them, they kept my dad off balance, and he was like a friend. They had a contract renewal every year, and my dad was like, Fred, oh, are they going to renew the contract? Little did he know <laughs> that, they, that the Stooge comedies were selling better than some of their features. Right. Were, were the Stooges out there in public during all those shorts? Were they doing live performances or even at the awards, like the Academy uh, Awards? Yes, uh, they did vaudeville. I think in their contract they had 12 weeks off to do whatever they wanted. Okay. And they, so they would shoot the eight shorts during part of the year, and then 12 weeks, what is that, three months? Yeah. Uh, they would take off and they would do vaudeville in certain key cities where there were major theaters. And they when could, that ended, yeah. about the time that Joe DeRita joined, it was really no more vaudeville, but they did, uh, what do you call it, those different mall exhibits, the Canadian Exposition, and things like that. I see. They just kept going. Calgary Stampede. Oh, the Calgary Stampede. I can hear. Is that Jack in the <laughs> that background? <is> Jack. <laughs> okay. Um, so during all these shorts, um, there's a lot of violence. It looks like. Did they really get hurt or hit each other during all of these skits? Well, you know, after all, you have to figure twenty-five years of batting and banging. But there was few that uh, they got hurt. Uh, my dad one time had to climb up on a table during a scene. And what they do is the special effects department will saw through the wood of the tabletop because he had a fall on it. It would break away and, you know, nothing. Well, he didn't saw it deep enough. And my dad fell on this table, it didn't break away, and he broke a rib. And uh, Larry, during one scene where they insisted that this special effect was going to work, they were going to throw a pen at his forehead, and they built a little gadget there. The pen was going to go into this thing, and then it would look like it was hitting him in the in the forehead. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> the pen was sticking out of Larry's forehead. It didn't kill him, but I don't think it felt good. And let's see, uh, well, they had uh, odds and ends like my dad. I was on the set at the time. Some, my dad was supposed to get hit in the face with a cream puff. And to make it look right, they take the cream and they put a little lamp black. It's like soot into it. And some of it wound up in his eyes. And they had to stop shooting, you know, minimal amount of time, like, quick, get the set doctor, and one, two, three, boom, and he was back to work. <laughs> so that's about the size of the, uh, n nothing disastrous. Right, and was there any fallout from the, you know, poking in the eyes or, the, you know, slapping on the forehead? Well, uh, yes, I mean, if you want to call it, there were certain, it was really strange, because I would get mail through the years, and my dad would, and in one direction, uh, there was a, you know, uh, it, they're too violent. In the meantime, it was all done with sound effects. Most of it, uh, they weren't hurt at all, but it was like a live cartoon, you know, the way they bounced back. Uh, but it really looked like they were hurt, getting hurt in certain scenes. And so the, some of the schools or some teachers or people would say, oh, you know, calm that down. In the meantime, He'd get fan letters from church groups asking for uh, for them to appear. So it was like a real mixed bag. I guess some people realized this wasn't real, and other people felt like maybe it certainly wasn't like today's computer games. 
Right. And were you or your brother ever extras in any of these shorts? Or oh, I was in one of the shorts, Pop Goes the Easel. And it was just a little tiny part. Uh, the Stooges were being chased down the street by, they were always being chased by somebody, the police. And they, when they, during the chase, during their running, there's two little kids playing hopscotch. And the two little kids were Larry's daughter and myself. But we just reacted to what was going on. We had no lines. And uh, they, so the Stooges then pushed us aside, or my dad did, and then the three of them ran through the hopscotch formation as the police followed through after us. And so that, uh, that was the only show that I was in, although I was in about nine or ten other films with... Humphrey Bogart was in one, uh, Shirley Temple, another. But it was fun, but I didn't really enjoy it. My dad loved what he was doing. Uh, how about your brother? Paul, uh, it was funny. Uh, my dad never brought him into any of the things to be uh, shot, but he did a few odds and ends at school. My dad would come to school, and he, Paul played a, uh, during a school pageant uh, a shot sideshow barker. And I think Paul, to this day, can remember the words he said, you know, come on in, folks, you know, whatever the Barkers do. And uh, But he's had kind of a bit of a ham in him through the years because he he does it on, upon request for certain organizations. He does a slideshow presentation that's really wonderful. He does it yearly at the Stooge Convention in Philadelphia. Is the Stooge Convention in Philadelphia every year? Yes. It's in, usually the last weekend in April. I did not know that. How big of an event is it? Well, it's pretty big that people come and they, it's at one of the major, like Holiday Inn, is it, uh, in, in a small town north of Philadelphia. And they have hundreds. They have like dealer's rooms where people are buying books and T-shirts and what have you. And then in different other rooms, uh, they will be screening the shorts. Paul is there doing his presentation during that evening. Uh, Gary Lassen, who is the president of the Stooge Fan Club, has uh, built a, it's really fabulous. It's called the Stoogeum, and it's like a museum to the Stooges. It's beautiful architecture, beautiful interior, and everything you could think of Stooge-wise inside it. And they'll screen films there. Do you stay in touch with the other children from the other Stooges? Well, uh, Phyllis passed away a number of years ago. Uh, her, her, grand, her son, uh, Eric, once in a while I'll talk to him. He's with the uh, Comedy 3 people. And uh, so there's not much of his family left at all. And then Curly's had two daughters by two different marriages. Marilyn uh, was Curly's second wife. Marilyn's mother was Curly's second wife. And then the fourth wife, uh, Janie, she lives, she's a half-sister, lives on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And let me think, Shemp's uh, daughter-in-law, I lost my cousin, uh, Shemp and Babe had a son, Mort, and he died in his 40s uh, from, I think, lymphoma. And uh, he was my favorite cousin. He was a wonderful guy. And let me think. What? Uh, so anyway, the only one left in Chum's family is the daughter-in-law and the two children that Mort and his, his uh, wife had. I see. Uh, Jill and Sandy. And that they, I, I will see intermittently. Yes. I see. And but that's about the size of that. <laughs> yeah. And and Norman, your husband. Um, how did he get involved with leaving comic books and entering into the directing of the Stooges features? Well, uh, my dad was crazy about Norman, uh, as well as me, <laughs> as well as I was. Uh, and he saw him, when you work on the West Coast and the comic book industry is on the East Coast, it's very difficult, especially the company he worked for, one of the two people, it was into the financial end, uh, did not pay up on time, and that's a terrible way to live, you know, waiting for a check. 
And so finally Norm got in disenchanted, and my dad could see that. And he said, look, uh, comics have a very facet of the movie industry in them, writing, directing, in fact, storyboards. Uh, it's like a storyboard, a comic book, and that's part of motion picture production today. And so my dad talked him into it. He uh, weaned himself away from comics, and uh, he still loved to draw. And he went back to it in certain other times of his life. He returned to comics. I see. And and did he also participate in the creation of any of these skits, or uh, or was he? Oh, uh, he had nothing to do with the shorts. But then he came up with ideas for features. And uh, he made, uh, I think, at least five features at Columbia with the Stooges in it. Stooges meet Hercules and the, those different features. And he, in the beginning, he produced them all. He came up with a basic storyline, and uh, two of them he directed. He really was multifaceted or multi-talented person. And, and your son, Jeff, was he in any of these? Yes, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, my other son uh, went off in a different direction, but Jeff was in the Western. Uh, he was in, oh, the, oh, there was one other. I can't remember the title of the one he was in, but he was in two of the features, and he just had minor parts, but he kind of liked it. He thought it was fun. And did he go off into that entertainment business? No. Uh, Jeffrey uh, went on to do... Uh, uh, he he did the Muppet Babies during it. He was a writer, and uh, he uh, created at least three hundred episodes of the Muppet Babies, and uh, well, that was for Jim Henson's company. Right. And uh, today is still doing uh, uh, Saturday morning children's programming. Uh, he also has written books on animation. You on have, how to write for animation. Right. And have and, you have you written any books yourself? Oh, dear. I have a, an attic with so many interesting things I wanted to share with fans. So that's what I did. I uh, did a book. Well, the original book, and I learned a lot from them, was a book called uh, Three Stooges Scrapbook. And uh, with the Lindbergs. And they were, I just got a lot of ideas from them and then I went on I did a book about Curly my uncle Curly I see and after that two books having to do with uh, the books of script I took two of the Stooge comedies and we broke them down Norman worked with me on the, these projects <laughs> and uh, we illustrated some of the script pages so that was kind of fun <laughs> did you help you, your did you help your dad on his book his memoirs well, uh, not the original, uh, there were many drafts, and he worked on it for years. My mother kept nagging at him to, to finish it. And uh, when it was finally completed, uh, he was very ill. He, only, he never lived to see it published. And, uh, but I sat down with him, and he had a wonderful memory right down to the end. He, he remembered I would show him photographs to put captions under, and he would recognize the different people or tell me what year it was and give me those details. Um, what was your dad's opinion of other teams like Abbott and Costello? Oh, uh, it, it, they envied them uh, because they, had, they were making features and the Stooges were only making shorts. And not until Norm got together with them did they do... Uh, features. I see. And the Marx Brothers or Laurel and Hardy, did they have any interaction with them at all? Uh, let's see. Well, he, 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 I'm sure he admired their work, right. uh, but they never worked together. I see. I know that uh, Abbott and Costello, uh, my dad, uh, you know, knew Lou and Bud. But not, you know, it's just a social thing. Right. There there are two people who wrote and directed Stooge films or Stooge shorts. And did you know Ed Burns or Elwood Ullman? Well, I didn't know Elwood well, but after uh, my dad passed away, uh, Ed Burns, I, we would go out to see him 
Norman and I, and he he was a terrific guy, really nice man. Right. And then there was another man, the sound man that worked on their films, Lodge Cunningham, and uh, he had some fabulous footage. He had the Harry Cohn would let him, and normally they he would he was a real tough taskmaster. But he would uh, let him go behind, in front of the camera, or, no, it's behind the camera, and use his 16 millimeter and shoot candids behind the, you know, while they were shooting. And uh, uh, so he had some fabulous color footage. Wow. Did, has that ever been published? No, but I've got, he even had a piece of one of the Stooge comedies. Uh, hold it one second. Yep. What is it? Oh, so uh, anyway, back to what you were saying. Yeah, uh, uh, has those sh- 16 millimeter movies behind the camera by the sound man, have they ever been published or printed? Uh, I don't know. Uh, he passed away. Uh, I got involved in my own life, and then Norman died, and I never even thought about it. But I know even had footage of Mae West and... Uh, whether his family uh, did something with it at some point, they might have, and it could be out there somewhere. Hmm. That's that's interesting. I n- I'd never seen it or heard about it, so that's news to me. Yeah, it was. Yeah, well, he was just. I think he did it more for fun, not for, or to maybe record it for history. What? It was silent, though, right? There was no sound. Uh, let me think. You know, I can't remember. Okay. I the only piece of footage I saw. I saw other things, but that I, I was given. I was given the stooge footage. Right. And I would have to look at it again. I haven't seen it in years. Okay. Now, e- w- even though you weren't a part of the um, the shorts yourself or the features, did you actually visit the studios while they were doing all these things? Well, I did it not often. Uh, maybe a half a dozen times. And uh, I... I probably, I remember the going to the set one time and seeing, I always thought it was, uh, we want our mummy, yeah, because the, the Stooges had, uh, and my dad had the, uh, like, piss helmets on, so that I figured that's Egypt, but I was told later it was a different short. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question before the break. Your mother, is she related to Houdini? Oh, yes. That's, she has two claims to fame. One is being the wife of Mo Howard. That was really special to her. And uh, Harry Houdini was a second cousin. I, I kind of remember you mentioning meeting Clark Gable. I met Cary Grant, Cary Grant at Columbia. He's about, you know, in his six foot something or other. And my dad, at the time, all of five foot four, and he had a habit of doing this. Uh, he turned to me and he turned to Carrie and he said, uh, Hi, Shorty. I'd like you to meet my daughter. And the Shorty was just a joke. But it was a fun day. Was he friendly with other people in the industry outside the Stooges? Uh, you know, socially, my dad was not a funny man. Uh, he was rather reserved. If he was with family, uh, like the dinner table, he would tell stories about the old days in Brooklyn, and uh, that it was really fabulous. Those stories were wonderful, funny, and his timing was wonderful. When he was seen in public, would fans come up to him and recognize him immediately? Yeah, uh, I mean, that happened quite a bit in the later years, when not the early years, but when, he, when the films went on television, the young kids would recognize him immediately, and even he would have his hair combed uh, back, not over his forehead, you know, it, it was always his own hair, but then when it came in white, it, uh, gray, whatever you want to call it, gray-white, uh, there was a period he didn't dye it, so... Uh, my dad overheard this young kid turn to his mother and said, Oh, look, there's Mo, and he dyed his hair white. <laughs> and so, uh, my, but they still recognized him. Was he asked to perform for fans, meaning, you know, 
did he feel like he was always on stage? Meaning the no, no, I don't think so. But he, uh, when they would come up to him and ask him for an autograph, he had either in the pocket of his jacket or in the trunk of his car, he had a slew of little three by five or two by three photos of himself, and he would proceed to sign those and give it to the kids. He felt that the fans made them and that he owed them a debt. And the debt was not to say no if somebody came up to him and asked him for an autograph. The Mo haircut, how did that come about? As a kid, uh, his mother wanted a daughter, and he was the fourth son. And he suffered through a, a few years of her trying to, his hair grew long, and she would proceed to make these like corkscrew curls. And he would have to go to school with these curls. And this went on for a year. He did befriend a guy that was a really good fighter. And he'd walk to school with him, and the guy would protect him. Well, it didn't always work that way. So finally, one day he got set up. He was at a friend's house. He took either a bowl or something and put it over his head. He took a scissor, and he went around the edge of that bowl, all the way around, cutting those curls off and uh, came out looking a, like a raggedy version of his stooge haircut. Uh, his mother, you know, of course, was very upset, and uh, but uh, she got over it. And Curly's shaved head, was that something that was always in the act, or, or did he? Uh, no, well, uh, in the act when they joined, um, I'm trying to think, I maybe the first six months or a year, he had this little wax mustache and and hair. And then at a point, uh, I think Healy uh, wanted him to change his, uh, he wanted him to look different than Larry and Mo. So he had him, uh, he, uh, he said something to, to Curly who then went, uh, disappeared for a little bit and came back with his head shaved down really to his skull. And uh, I don't know whether this part is true, but he kind of minced in, you know, kind of silly-like and said, if you want me, just call me Curly, you know, uh, with no head, no hair on his head. That was my so, whether it evolved that way or not, I'm not sure. Okay. And, and Larry's hairstyle was intentional, or was he always like that? Well, Larry had pretty much the same hair, but it was it, it curled up if he took his fingers and kind of, uh, lift it up. <laughs> I don't know whether he used a comb to do that or his fingers, to be sure. <laughs> but uh, he has just evolved very easily. All he'd have to do is just mess it up real good because it had a lot of curl in it. What, was he a family friend, Larry? With um... Yeah, well, by the time you do 12 weeks of vaudeville, make eight shorts, uh, there isn't too much time left in the year. So... Uh, we would see them over holidays or if we had happy events like a wedding or some special event. Otherwise, they pretty much led their own, each one of them led their own way of life uh, socially. Did the Stooges ever do any radio? I think they did radio interviews, but they never had a radio show. Uh, I know that uh, it, there's a cute story about, well, it kind of shows you my dad's personality, and that has to do with radio and me as a young kid. I was about 12 years old, and I loved the radio. I, I just, um, and my favorite shows were things like Orphan Annie and Jack Armstrong, the old American boy, or whatever he was called. And I used to listen, and there was a commercial, not a commercial, but they had like a sales pitch for the for the product that was being sold, like say on Off and Andy. One of them was like a scouring powder, you know, like a uh, comet, only it had a different name in those days. And they, the man pitching their product said, you know, if you send in 36 labels, uh, it was a large amount, uh, to the program, we'll send you a nurse's uniform. Well, I had my heart set on that, and anything I wanted, my dad, it was like a built-in Santa Claus. So the next thing you know, my dad went out, he bought a whole case of cleanser, and he proceeded to 
I never saw him do it, but he had to have gotten those labels off of 36 cans, sent them in to the uh, radio station, and the next thing, you know, I get this notion of the uniform, which probably was no great shakes. I think it was a little white cap with a red cross on it and an apron. The really positive part of it came when my dad went to the next writers' conference. He said, I got a great idea. We're going to, the Stooges are going to be selling cleanser. And I never saw that short, so I don't know what else is in it that uh, transpired. But he was, re my dad cared about really doing a good job. Uh, John Jensen? Yeah, uh, about Curly, he had a stroke somewhere around 1946 or 47, but uh, I understand he still appeared yeah. in one or two one, films yeah. afterwards. Right. And was it fairly healthy despite that? And did she see him on occasion until he died in 1952? Uh, well, after the stroke, uh, I think he, there were different periods. He started to get better after a while, but uh, I think he had some minor strokes earlier that year. Uh, as, and as I look at photographs, the 8x10s eight, eight of him, during the period, say, the, uh, the, not the last short, but maybe the la next to the last, and the expression on his face it was zero. He, you could just see it in his eyes. There was something wrong. Yeah, he had lost that animated look. But but what was his condition after the stroke? Was he wheelchair oh, bound? After the stroke, uh, there was a period where I, uh, if I remember right, where he couldn't walk and he could, could hardly talk. And then slowly he got a little better. And there was a period there where he, uh, a couple of years after, where he got married because he actually had had his stroke and either she she wasn't a nurse the woman he married but she really nursed him back to health and he was okay for maybe another year or so and then uh then he passed away and didn't he appear in one more short as a passenger yeah, one where they my dad wanted to encourage him and make him feel like he was going to come back and it was I can't remember, hold that lion? I'm not sure. And they were sitting on a train, and uh, Curly was there with a full head of hair, and uh, Shemp was in the shore. That's the first time they ever appeared, all of them together. Right, and he was sitting down the whole time on the train, right. if I remember. Okay. Right. 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 Any other questions on the crowd? Um, yes, in the back. I it's Bob, I can't see him behind her. Does she know if they made many records? I know that there was at least one Christmas record because Moskowitz used to play it. Well, did they make records? The answer is yes. And something, there was a Christmas record, and there were others. Uh, not a lot, uh, but, and I have copies, you know, of some of them. I don't think I have a player that could play them, though. Because it wasn't like, uh, I think they were more like 78s or... What, what kind of music did Mo like? What did he like? Oh, he loved Barbershop, believe it or not. And, and some of the songs from the early years, I remember one of his favorites was a song called How Deep Is the Ocean. <laughs> I think it was kind of romantic and probably thought of my mom. John? Uh, I'm just more about what her father was like at home when he wasn't uh, doing his shows and things. I mean, he was he, he in hobbies. Right. Right. Okay. What did your dad enjoy doing on his time off? Did he have any hobbies or like to do anything r repeatedly? There's different eras. Like, there, you know, when he was younger, he, he played a little golf, not a lot and never had enough time to really practice anything. Then as he got older, uh, he liked working with pottery. It wasn't the kind that you would create a sculpture with, but the kind that had, they call it slip, and you'd pour it into a mold, and it would come out, um, and then it was baked in a kiln. And then what he would do is take that, he would choose shapes and objects and things, and then he would do the coloring, and then it was fired after that. So he got a kick out of doing that. And he'd make these cups, like mugs, 
and he would proceed to put different people's names on them. And he went, during the years, he would send them to famous people. Uh, I have a letter, a thank you letter from uh, Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy. I have one, uh, you know, lots of famous celebrities, you know, thank you for the mug. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. Being the daughter of Mo Howard, how were you treated in school? Oh, let's see. Well, um, I was kind of reticent about telling my friends who my dad was because I never knew the reaction I would get. Way back in my day, uh, there were very few women that enjoyed that kind of comedy. They thought it was silly. So I didn't know how they would react if I mentioned to them uh, my dad is one of those stooges. They could either say, oh, that's great, or they could say, ooh, I can't stand that kind of comedy. And so uh, I just didn't say anything. I wouldn't lie, but, uh, but on the other hand, my brother lied. And what he would do is he wanted to be liked for who he was. So if somebody asked him, what, and he wanted to fit in. So if somebody asked him what his father did for a living, he'd say, he's a meter reader for the gas company. <laughs> well, he was in one so, of the shorts. Pardon? <laughs> I think he was a meter reader in one of the shorts. No, uh, uh, I don't think my brother was ever in the shorts. No, I meant your your, your dad. Oh, oh yeah. I see. That could be true. You're yeah. right. Yeah, I know he was a plumber. I remember that one. Right, and a surgeon, and a yeah. and Hitler, and <laughs> you name it. And he would, you know, a lot of days he he liked to do something with Paul because he felt he he left him so much on those trips uh, to do the vaudeville. So he would come back to, uh, from work, and one day you would see my dad playing baseball with Paul in the backyard, and he'd have him a prisoner's outfit, or he'd have a you you name it from a short, and he'd have that costume on with the makeup still on if there was makeup needed. <laughs> and uh, anybody that would come in there would, would have thought they were both crazy. <laughs> Question? <sighs> um, yeah, I heard that Curly was a ballroom dancer. That's true, actually. Um, the rumor is that Curly was a ballroom dancer, and if so, did he ever enter any contests? Uh, I don't know about the contest, but he, as a young man, he was very light on his feet. Uh, I don't know if he was as heavy then as he was mm -hmm. later on in his career, but he was always extremely graceful and light on his feet and an excellent dancer. And uh, he, he loved music. Uh, he might have uh, geared himself into something like that. Okay, Mike. How accurate was the movie on the Stooges' life that was made? Uh, how accurate was the movie on the Stooges that was made a couple of years ago? Uh, well, it, the two things that jumped out at me was were uh, that my dad never asked Curly to sign a contract while he was ill or dying or whatever happened in that scene. Uh, he, that never occurred. They have to make things dramatic, and, you know, so that was the reason for that. And then they had, you know, to be able to, they sort of painted it as though he was left almost broke at the end of his life, and and uh, that wasn't true. He was very careful about what he did, and he he really cared for my brother and I so much that I think he worked hard really trying to leave an estate for his kids you know that was his goal they always split everything they made which was every stooge that replaced another stooge uh they all split evenly was curly when he had his stroke for the six years before he passed away receiving anything from that well the brothers got together uh curly and, and larry pitched in they were like brothers, wow. and uh, gave, sent X amount of money to him so he would be a, you know, able to live. Um, that's going to do it for now, Joan. Um, oh, we, you know. we really enjoyed it, and I want uh, everybody here to give her a big round of applause. Wow, that I heard. Oh, you can hear <laughs> that, huh? Okay. Well, thank <laughs> anyway, you very much. You're and certainly I welcome, Sean. You're, you're a good sport. 
All righty. I'll talk to you later, Joan, okay? Okay. Bye-bye. I'll talk to you. Bye-bye. You lame brain. 